Hi, I'm Dr. Ralph A. I'm a thoracic surgeon and a member of the Division of Thoracic Surgery at Swedish Cancer Institute and Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. Today I'm going to talk to you about gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is also known as GERD. It's the most common disorder of the upper gastrointestinal tract, affecting a large percentage of the American population. We're going to review the cause, diagnosis, significance, and treatment options for GERD, as well as Barrett's esophagus, which is a complication of GERD, and the relationship between GERD, Barrett's, and the rapidly rising rate of cancer of the gastrointestinal junction. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, also known as heartburn, acid reflux, or indigestion, is extremely common. It's estimated that 40% of people in the United States are on medication for reflux at least once a month or more. For most people, heartburn is just a nuisance. But for 10 to 15% of people, it's a pretty significant problem that can interfere with daily life. GERD is caused by a breakdown in the barrier between the stomach and the esophagus, which allows acid and other digestive fluids in the stomach to come up into the esophagus. Though the stomach lining is resistant to the harsh nature of these fluids, the esophagus is not. When acid enters the esophagus, people can experience a wide variety of symptoms. The most common or typical symptoms are heartburn, which is a painful burning sensation behind the breastbone and radiates up toward the neck as well as regurgitation, which is the sensation of stomach contents coming back up into the throat or the mouth. Less common symptoms of GERD can affect the lungs, including cough, asthma, pneumonia, fibrosis of the lungs or scarring, as well as the nose and the throat, such as a sore throat, throat clearing, or hoarseness, or the heart, which can cause chest pain, and the mouth, causing dental caries or enamel erosion. Although we don't think of reflux as a serious disease, when we look at the impact that it can have on a person's quality of life and compare it to major illnesses like arthritis, heart disease, and diabetes, it ranks very high. In fact, it can affect multiple areas of a person's life, including sleeping habits, social life, enjoyment of foods, and a person's overall sense of well-being. Reflux can have a number of serious health consequences including narrowing of the esophagus through repetitive injury and scarring, the development of ulcers, and esophageal bleeding, which sometimes don't respond to medication. It's also been associated with sleep disturbances and issues with weight management. Serious lung complications can develop. Regurgitation of stomach contents up into the mouth and the throat can lead to fluid that enters the lungs, called aspiration. This can have life-threatening consequences. Most patients with long-standing GERD will develop a hiatal hernia or stomach herniation in which the stomach slips up through the diaphragm into the chest cavity. The hernia usually worsens the symptoms of GERD, but even by itself, the hernia can result in trouble swallowing and eating, and it has risk of strangulation in which the stomach can twist and cut off the blood supply to a portion of the stomach. This can be a life-threatening emergency. Another serious complication of GERD is the development of Barrett's esophagus uh, which can lead to cancer of the esophagus. We'll discuss this further later in this podcast. How do we manage reflux? GERD can be managed in many different ways depending on a patient's preference and the seriousness of the condition. Possible management methods include medical treatment with a variety of medications, experimental endoscopic treatment which in involves only a scope passed through the mouth into the stomach, or surgery and a variety of procedures. In terms of medical treatment, there are many different kinds of drugs that can act against reflux. We're all familiar with standard antacids such as Pepto-Bismol and Maalox, which work well for mild disease. There are also H2 blockers, which include Zantac and Pepsid, often available over the counter, and the strongest of the medications, which are proton pump inhibitors, also known as PPIs. And these include Prilosec, Nexium, and several others, and are used to treat the more severe reflux. Though people are usually pretty successful with managing mild reflux with medication and control of diet, medications can be increasingly costly and may provide incomplete relief. There have also been questions raised about long-term safety of these medications. It's important to note that these medications largely suppress the stomach acid production, which is a normal bodily function. And people are starting to question whether it's okay to suppress acid year after year. Uh, the biggest, uh, most notable concerns have been with absorption of vitamins and minerals such as calcium, vitamin D, and iron. And some studies have documented a higher rate of osteoporosis and hip fracture, which may be due to a lack of absorption. 
There have also been some concerns raised about infections that can develop uh, because the acid in our stomach kills bacteria that we swallow. And without that acid as a defense mechanism, some bacteria may be able to get through to the rest of the body. One of the biggest concerns that's been raised and the most controversial relates to the higher incidence of cancer of the gastroesophageal junction. Rates of this cancer have increased about 600% in the last 30 years. This overlaps exactly with when these strong acid suppressant medications were first introduced. And there are several studies that have raised concern that there may be a linkage between the medications and an environment that allows for the earliest cancer changes to occur. There is no convincing proof that these drugs cause cancer. Uh, this is a very controversial area. Uh, and so it's just one factor that someone should consider when they're determining the best options for them in terms of long-term treatment. In terms of endoscopic treatment for GERD, uh, there have been some special instruments that have been developed that can be placed through or on an endoscope and treat the reflux by doing a procedure inside the stomach. Unfortunately, most of the techniques that have been developed have resulted in inadequate results and are no longer available. But it is a constant area of research with new techniques emerging all the time. At this time, endoscopic treatment remains experimental. If you're interested in learning more about these methods, please talk to your physician for more information. In terms of surgical treatment, this is a well-established treatment that has been available for many years and has been offered to patients for GERD. It's been shown in several research trials to be at least as good as twice daily medical therapy, if not better for long-term management of GERD. Patients may consider a surgical treatment of GERD if they have proven reflux and are troubled by the possibility of taking medication for the rest of their life, or if their current medical treatment does not completely control their reflux, or if they have complications from their reflux. They may have breakthrough symptoms, lifestyle restrictions such as limitation on diet or activity, and in more advanced cases of GERD, those with hiatal hernia and Barrett's esophagus, successful surgery does give an advantage over using medications. The overall success rate of anti-reflux surgery is very high when done in a competent anti-reflux center. Approximately 80% of patients report good to excellent results after five years, and 90% of patients report improved results. 10% of patients will develop recurrent symptoms of reflux, and approximately 5% of patients will need to undergo a reoperation because of a complete failure of the operation. What are the different kinds of anti-reflux surgery? Uh, the procedure can be performed either laparoscopically with a video approach or with an open incision. Today, the vast majority of operations are done laparoscopically using the video approach with small incisions, resulting in a shorter recovery. There are several different operations to repair gastroesophageal reflux. The two most commonly done at Swedish include the Nissen repair and the Hill repair. The two payers re repair is done in select situations. And we also do a combination of the Hill and Nissen repairs, or as we refer to it, the hybrid procedure. We won't have time to get into the details of those procedures today, but if you're interested in considering an operation, you should speak with your surgeon about your options. They all work by reconstructing the normal anatomy and function of the gastroesophageal junction as closely as possible. This includes repairing a hiatal hernia if one is present, and bringing the lowermost part of the esophagus and the gastroesophageal junction back into the abdomen where they belong. It also includes reconfiguring the connection between the esophagus and the stomach while tightening the sphincter muscle at the bottom end of the esophagus. These stitches go on the outside of the esophagus and the stomach. We don't make any openings into the stomach or the esophagus. Again, if you want more information, it's best to speak directly to your physician. Despite the fact that anti-reflux surgery is well established and is very safe, it's still a major operation and even when done laparoscopically, it carries the risk of any major operation, including the potential for life-threatening complications. Fortunately, those risks have been very small. The national mortality rate for this type of surgery is approximately 0.2% and our rates at Swedish have been lower than that. Serious complications are also uncommon, approximately 1%, and include the risk of injury to surrounding organs such as the esophagus, the stomach, the spleen, the liver, and the nerves that run along the repair called the vagus nerves. There are also the usual risks that go along with any operation such as reaction to anesthesia, bleeding, infection, and blood clots to the lungs. There is also the possibility that laparoscopic repair may need to be converted to an open operation, 
though that risk is small, less than 1% in our experience. After laparoscopic repair, the hospital stay is typically 24 to 48 hours, though that can vary considerably from one person to another. If it's necessary to convert to an open operation during the procedure, the hospital stay is typically five to seven days. After a laparoscopic repair, pain medication is usually required for three to five days following surgery. After the operation, fatigue is experienced, and this typically lasts one to three weeks. In the first six weeks after surgery, it's also important to avoid straining hard or lifting more than 10 to 20 pounds in order not to disrupt the repair. The biggest side effect of esophageal surgery is difficulty swallowing, also called dysphagia. It's recommended to stay on a liquid to very soft food diet during that time period. Swallowing gradually improves, and usually people are eating a normal or near normal diet by six weeks after surgery. Other longer term side effects include difficulty vomiting and burping. Vomiting isn't medically necessary, and it's hard on the repair. So we recommend if you do get nauseated, you try to suppress this with medications by contacting your physician. On the other hand, burping is a bit of an issue because if people can't burp, they tend to have a little more gas out from below and some bloating. These problems usually improve over time, and there are a number of medications that can help. Diarrhea can happen occasionally in the first few months. It's uncommon and usually resolves spontaneously. In general, esophageal surgery is a very well-tolerated operation, and the satisfaction level with the procedure is extremely high.